Hello, everybody. It's Jody Franklin, and I am so excited to once again have Chris Kresser join us today. Um, I don't know if you even know this, Chris, but you're one of the main reasons I even got into functional medicine in the first place. I was so inspired by learning from you, listening to your podcast, reading books, um, and your writings and everything. And uh, it's it's just such an honor to have you on today. Um, you're such a big influencer in this field. And I know you've inspired so many to get into this field. So welcome. Yeah, thank you, Jody, for that kind and heartfelt introduction. And I'm just glad my work's been of some value to you and others here and happy to um, happy to be here. Like I said, it's one of my favorite topics to discuss and looking forward to answering some questions. Absolutely. And for those of you who don't know Chris, he is the co-founder of the California Center for Functional Medicine. He's the founder for Cresser Institute, for which actually we have a discount code in our group. If anybody is interested in the practitioner training, let us know and we can get you that um, coupon as well for when it opens up again. He's the host of the top ranked health podcast, Revolution Health Radio, and the podcast is phenomenal. You should all definitely subscribe to that. He's the New York Times bestselling author of The Paleo Cure and Unconventional Medicine. He is one of the most respected clinicians and educators in the field of functional medicine and, and in ancestral health. He's trained over 2,000 clinicians and health coaches from 50 different countries in his very unique approach. And he's named one of the top um, 100 most influential people in health and, and fitness by greatest.com. He's also appeared on as a featured guest on Dr. Oz, Time, The Atlantic, NPR, Fox and Friends, and many others. So Chris, again, thank you so much for coming here. And I can't wait to hear what you're going to talk today about the top six nutrients um, that your patients and clients are struggling with and what to do about it. And uh, we're going to give us a very special offer for members of our group as well, um, both an opportunity to become an affiliate for uh, Adapt Naturals, which is the supplement company that Chris is founder of. And um, so you can actually earn a substantial commission on um, on the supplements if you're going to provide them for your patients and clients. You're also going to get a coupon today to uh, actually for 20% off your first purchase. And or if you become an affiliate with earning, you can earn up to 50% commission on the supplements. So there's some great opportunities as well. But Chris, again, thank you so much. And maybe you could start by telling us, you know, some of the the top nutrients that your people's patients are missing out on and, and uh, yeah. yeah, give us some. Um... Thank you, Jody. I will for sure. So this is a, an area that I've become increasingly concerned with over the course of my career, as I've learned more, as I've studied more of the research, as I've had the experience of treating thousands of patients, training thousands of healthcare providers. And I really think it's the elephant in the room. Um, it, oftentimes when we're, working with patients or with clients in whatever capacity, whether you're a doctor, health coach, uh, occupational therapist, physical therapist, psychologist, nutrient deficiencies are absurdly common. Uh, most of us tend to believe that there are only things, you know, that, that nutrient deficiency only happens in the developing world. You know, uh, uh, iron deficiency, anemia, or scurvy, or rickets, or problems like that. We don't have them in, in the U.S. anymore, right? Uh, well, <laughs> it is true that rickets and scurvy aren't common anymore, but iron deficiency anemia still affects millions of people. Um, and we now know through uh, research from groups like the Linus Pauling Institute that the vast majority of Americans have at least one, but often several micronutrient deficiencies. So as you mentioned, Jody, I'm just going to cover the, what I think are the top six Um and, and these are, statistically speaking, the most common deficiencies and also some of the most problematic in terms of the health impact. So I'll just um, give you the six, uh, the, the list of the six right now, and then we can work our way through them. And Jody, feel free to jump in and ask questions or any people on the webinar so that I'm not just giving a monologue here for, <laughs> for an hour, because that will be boring. But um, so the, the nutrient deficiencies are choline, vitamin D, magnesium, potassium, vitamin K and K2. We're going to focus mostly on K2 and vitamin E. 
And I'll tell you right off the bat that for the first four, choline, vitamin D, magnesium, potassium, the Linus Pauling Institute has estimated that over 90% of Americans don't get enough of these nutrients. That's wow. crazy. Over that 90%. <laughs> And with vitamin, with choline, it's 99%. I've seen some estimates that 100% of Americans don't get enough choline. And certainly there must be like at least 10 or 15 Americans getting enough choline, but it's so high that they're just rounding it up to 100%. You know, it's over 99%. That's um, crazy. And I know, Chris, I know you had, you're a big advocate for healthy, having healthy babies, right? And how critical yes. is, is choline for a child's or a baby's brain? It's absolutely essential. Uh, choline deficiency is associated with neural tube defects, similar to folate deficiency. So it's one of the most critical nutrients that we talk about for women who are trying to conceive and, and bring, you know, deliver a healthy baby, uh, which, as you point out, Jody, has been a, a, a strong interest of mine for many, many years. Um, so choline is actually a relatively new kid on the block. It was, it's only been recognized as essential uh, meaning that we can't produce enough of it on our own and we have to obtain it from the diet since 1998. So we're talking about really 25 year period here. And at that time, the adequate intake level that was associated or established was 425 milligrams a day for women and 550 for men. And the current estimate, as I said, is that only about one to 2% of Americans meet that adequate intake level. Mm -hmm. But even worse, lots of nutritional researchers like Chris, Dr. Chris Masterjohn, who I'm sure many people watching this are familiar with, have, have argued that you, that intake level is in, a, in and of itself inadequate, that the so-called adequate intake level is not adequate for choline. And the reason for that is that many people have genetic polymorphisms that make it more difficult for them to endogenously produce choline or convert it to the active forms. And so they need to actually get more choline in the diet in order to meet their, their daily requirement. And, uh, you know, choline is, is uh, it's involved in the cell membrane signaling, lipid transport, methylation, neurotransmitter signaling, uh, with particularly the synthesis of acetylcholine, it's a component of the cell membrane itself in the form of phosphatidylcholine. It regulates several metabolic pathways and it also helps with detoxification. So given that long list of, of, of functions, it's not surprising to learn that choline deficiency can cause everything from fatigue to insomnia to cognitive memory problems, nerve and muscle imbalances, liver dysfunction, particularly non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which affects almost one in three Americans today, cardiovascular disease, uh, red blood cell issues, anemia, infertility, kidney failure, high blood pressure. I mean, the list goes on because of how prevalent choline is in our, in our bodies and how important it is for so many different biochemical reactions. Unbelievable. So, <clears throat> yeah. I'm, I'm curious, uh, you know, back in the old days when eggs, when chickens were out in the pasture and there was right. no, you know, crap, you know, GMO feed and things like that. They had, the eggs had higher levels of choline and the meats had higher levels of choline with pasture raised meat. Correct. And nowadays, most, the vast majority of the world or Americans especially are getting their um, eggs from the, the 99 cent dozen <laughs> eggs in the That's right. crap eggs. They, they just don't have the choline levels that the, that we, the food just doesn't have it like it used to have. Right. right? That's a great point, uh, and, and that's still true today. Like uh, one of the best sources of choline is is pasture raised pasture raised eggs, not conventionally raised eggs, pasture raised eggs, and you can see the difference in the yolk. You know, if you crack open an egg and the yolk is about the same color as the white, or you know, a very pale yellow, that's a really good sign that there's not a lot of nutrition in that egg. It should be a deep, deep, a deep yellow or a deep orange color. Uh, but the other thing that has changed, Jody, is just our habits around what parts of the animal that we eat today. Um, mm -hmm. Ancestrally, our, our, relic, our distant and even recent ancestors, perhaps your parents or grandparents, ate organs like liver. And we rarely eat those uh, organs today. I mean, there's been a bit of a resurgence lately, certainly an interest in that and nose to tail. I wrote about that in my first book, The Paleo Care, and I'm sure lots of folks have heard 
about liver king and all you know all the controversy around that but it turns out that liver is actually the number one beef liver in particular is the number one dietary source of choline by a long shot so um the uh, three ounce just three ounces of, of beef liver has 400 milligrams of choline in it compared to less than 80 milligrams in the same amount of cooked ground beef so wow. you are still getting some in ground beef you know it's, it's it's a decent source but you're getting five times more by eating the equivalent amount of liver so um, this is one of the reasons i think why choline deficiency is so common because it's not found in most plant foods in any significant amount it's not even found in muscle meats like be you know ground beef or steak or chicken you know bone, boneless skinless chicken breast which is a sort of popular choice right. um and you don't so want exactly if you're not eating organ meats and you're not eating a substantial amount of pasture-raised egg yolks then you're probably going to be choline deficient so this is a, a major issue can I put a plug in for your supplement? Cause I just want to say this, um, I'm going to share my screen, but this is uh, adapt naturals, uh, bioavailable organ. And I am really impressed with this. Cause a lot of these, um, bioavailable kind of, um, liver things that, you know, that it's just one organ, it's just the liver, but you went ahead and put in, what are there five different organ meats in here? Yep. Yeah. So really the recent, Recent study uh, by Ty Beal and colleagues found that four out of the seven top most nutrient dense foods were organ meats: liver, mm. uh, kidney, heart, and and spleen. And then uh, pancreas is only just just a little bit below the list. So we went ahead and put all five of those organs in this blend because they have complementary nutrient profiles. You know, spleen for is actually even higher in iron than liver is. Most people don't know that. It's, it's the highest ounce for ounce source of iron that you can get in a diet. And when wow. I have patients with really severe iron deficiency who are not responding to any other kind of iron supplement, I give them spleen along with liver and that will often turn the corner. So we put all five of those in the blend and we have a, a high amount of, of total organs per serving and they're all from grass fed uh, animals, you know, in, in pristine environments. So very clean source of oh, organ meats. Great. And Terry's going to put the link for you all to get 20% off uh, with the link that we're providing. And also um, she's going to also provide the link where you can sell this wholesale to your, to your clients. You, you get the wholesale price and you sell it obviously at retail for your clients because they can't get it at any other price. It's only for people that have it practice. Now there's a, there's an application process for this, but health coaches can also do this and practitioners can do this. And, um, you will be able to, uh, you know, make a nice profit. A lot of the premium brands don't allow coaches to partake and um, Chris is allowing that. So if you're a health coach, you can also partake in this and be able to sell this and, and make a nice profit on it. But more importantly, get a really good source of iron to your clients who are iron deficient. And, you know, this is a big problem. I see ferritin um, levels crazy low in a lot of people. And it's it's so important for, you know, your thyroid to convert T4 to T3 thyroid hormone. People are exhausted because they're they're iron deficient. And so this is a great way to do it, get, get it into their cells. And I, I just love that you're including the spleen who eats spleen. I mean, yuck. I would not, <laughs> I'm yeah, so glad spleen, you put that in the capsule because, uh, oh my gosh, I can't even imagine eating that, but, but, you know, we need it. We used to, as, like Chris said, you know, our ancestors ate this stuff. They ate kidneys, they yeah. ate heart, they ate everything. And so um, yeah. it's hard. It's sometimes for people to, to even stomach liver, but this is so bioavailable. It's going to get into their cells way better better than the, than the, you know, vegetarian iron that's out there. It just doesn't yeah. improve the blood levels of iron like this. Right, Chris? Absolutely. Yeah. And these, this is hundred percent food-based. It's just or, uh, organs from grass-fed animals that have been uh, frozen and freeze, freeze dried into a powder and put into capsules. So it's really almost identical to eating um, the organ meats, except that you don't have to taste them or prepare them <laughs> yourself, which is a really big benefit for most people. I mean, I will eat liver occasionally. I have not developed the taste for, for pancreas uh, and kidney and, and spleen. It's just, um, 
I wish I did, but I, I'm um, I'm taking these myself because I want to get the, the incredible benefits. I mean, we talked about choline. You mentioned we mentioned iron, but there's also B6, B12, uh, all of the, the folate, a fantastic source of folate, very high in, in zinc and copper, bioavailable sources of zinc and copper, and a lot of the amino acids, carnitine, you just go all, you know, it's really kind of the way I explain it to people, it's like nature's multivitamin, uh, organ meat. Uh, that's the best way to think of it. And it's a really safe and accessible way to boost your nutrient status. And I, I would say the two biggest benefits people see from eating organ meat are um, more energy and more sustained energy throughout the day. And, um, just better performance in all areas. So co cognitive performance, mental clarity, sharpness, physical performance, recovery from exercise, just more vitality. If I could use, if I could say one word, it's, it's um, you know, vitality. That's what people experience. I'm so glad you mentioned that. And I think, you know, years ago, I heard you say that, you know, what's the most nutritionally dense food on the planet? And people think, mm -hmm. oh, you know, kale or something like that. Yeah, Kale's not even yeah. close. The number one <laughs> no. is, is organ meats, right? By far, like mm -hmm. not even, nothing yeah. else even comes close to the nutritional density. And you took yeah. those organs and freeze dried them. So it's very concentrated. So if you have somebody, I mean, this is like, in, in, you know, you mentioned the zinc, that's not even on your top six, but I, yeah, that the zinc deficiency is also rampant. And, you know, we're getting everyone's getting COVID and everyone's getting viruses and, you know, autoimmune diseases and things like that. And I find zinc deficiency is really rampant, too. So to get this all in a capsule is really great. And so I'm really glad you put this together. Absolutely. But do you want to talk about we talk, um, we talk anything about else about D? choline? What's that? No, I think we should move on so we can. Yeah. I mean, we could go all day long on any of these nutrients, but let's let's cover all six of them so people have a good sense. Uh, vitamin D will, will probably not surprise anyone that this is on the list because I think by now most people have gotten the memo that um, vitamin D is critical and most people are not getting enough. It's about 92% of Americans not getting enough, 94% according to Linus Pauling Institute, depending on what statistics you look at. And everyone, well, I shouldn't say everyone, most people now know that it plays a really important role in immune function. There are lots of studies actually looking at the relationship between vitamin D and immune defense against all kinds of viral infections, including SARS, COVID, SARS coronavirus 2. Um, it plays a critical role in met metabolic health. So I'm sure you've all heard that vitamin D deficiency is correlated with type 2 diabetes and metabolic syndrome and cardiovascular disease. Uh, and then it plays a critical role in bone health. You know, both vitamin D and K2, which we're going to talk about later, work together to regulate calcium metabolism. So vitamin D deficiency is associated with osteopenia, osteoporosis. But recent research has, has identified a whole lot of other roles and benefits of vitamin D that we didn't know about before. One is depression. It turns out that vitamin D is as effective as an antidepressant as SSRIs or more in some cases. And I'm sure some people have had a um, personal experience of this, like going out and getting a lot of sun exposure and how that impacts mood. Well, vitamin D is not the only reason for that, but it turns out that it actually is one of the main reasons that, um, that sunlight has an antidepressant effect. Um, another role is is uh, inf anti it's an anti-inflammatory. So most modern chronic disease is characterized by inflammation and vitamin D we now know has an anti-inflammatory effect. So that's perhaps another reason why it helps with so many different conditions because all of those conditions are characterized by inflammation. And then um, there are studies, more recent studies that show that just maintaining adequate vitamin D levels extends our lifespan. So you know, I don't know about you, but I, that's a big, a pretty important one for me and not just lifespan, but health span. Like I want to live a long, healthy life, but I want to stay healthy and active all the way up until I die. And vitamin D turns out to be a pretty crucial nutrient um, to, to do that. So there are three ways to get vitamin D. One is sun exposure, two is food, and three uh, is supplementation. Sun exposure is, is not really a viable rate for most people most of the time. Jody, you live in Boston, so uh, in the winter, 
or even in the fall or spring for that matter, you're just not getting a lot of vitamin D if, even if you spend time outside because the solar angle is so low that it doesn't really produce much vitamin D in contact with your skin. As, um, as evidenced by my pasty white skin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and if you live in a city with a lot of tall buildings, you might not be getting much sun exposure anyways, right? So New York City, people in, in cities, people at northern latitudes or far southern latitudes, they're not getting a lot of sun exposure for at least parts of the year. And even when they do, the solar angle is too low to make much of a difference. So, you know, if you live on the equator, awesome. Uh, you probably don't need to worry too much about your vitamin D levels, although some people still will. But for most of the rest of us that are living in the industrialized world, it's it's some, we can't rely on sun exposure alone. And the statistics just bear that out because so many people are deficient in, in vitamin D. We, we know that sun exposure is not enough. Same for food. There are some food sources of vitamin D, you know, cold water fatty fish has some, pasture raised egg yolks will have some, but again, it's not generally enough to meet our, our daily requirement for vitamin D. And this is a, you know, people sometimes say, well, how is that possible? Like, that doesn't make any sense. Why, why would we have a need for this vitamin we can't get enough of? Well, our lifestyle has changed dramatically, <laughs> you know, even in the past 200 years. So historically, our ancestors lived outside and they had no problem meeting their vitamin D needs, especially when most humans were living near the, the equatorial region. But it's this migration uh, um, away from the equator and a movement towards indoor lifestyles that has made this such a challenge. So that leaves supplementation. And I, I really do believe that um, both, through, both through the research and clinical experience that almost everybody, except for the cases I mentioned, needs to be taking vitamin D in order to maintain their, their D levels. And that amount might change throughout the year. Like for, for myself, for example, I'm really active. I spend a lot of time outside in the summer and I get a fair amount of sun exposure. So I don't tend to need it for maybe three months a, a year, but I do take it the rest of the year. Um, for, for someone who's not spending a lot of time outside, not getting sun exposure or they're covering up, you know, all the time or putting sunscreen all the time, then I would say you got to take vitamin D all, all throughout the year. I'm so glad you brought up vitamin D and, you know, cancer runs rampant in my family. I know that, you know, if you could patent vitamin D, they'd probably make it a drug for anti-cancer, right? But I, I wanted to ask yeah. you, um, so for those of you who are still in Western medicine and, you know, thinking about functional medicine or you're on the fence or you don't have the education yet, the, don't look at the reference ranges for vitamin D, right, Chris? I mean, what do you think is optimal? Because it because most people, they you know, a lot of Western medicine practitioners will look at a vitamin D level of 32 and say, okay, that's in reference range, you're all set. But that's not adequate, right, Chris? For the vast majority of people, it's not. Um, I think what we're moving towards is 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 an individualized level of vitamin D where we consider genetics, ethnic heritage geography, where you live, you know, all of those factors, but we're not there yet. And what we know is that a level of 30 or 32 is going to lead to an active vitamin D deficiency in most cases. And so I target a range in my patients of, of 40 to 60. Um, and if, if they have autoimmune disease, definitely towards the higher end of that range. Um, or any other kind of immune challenge where they benefit from more vitamin D. And in order to maintain that range, most people are going to need, I would say, an average of 4,000 to 5,000 IU per day. Some can get away with lower, especially, like I said, if they tend to spend more time outside and it's summertime, et cetera. Some will need higher because we know that certain populations don't convert sunlight into vitamin D as efficiently or don't absorb vitamin D from supplements or food as efficiently. For example, people who are obese or who have metabolic issues, a lot of studies suggest they may need to take up to 10,000 IU per day just to maintain that normal vitamin D level. And I've seen this in my practice over and over. Someone will come in and you know they're taking 2,000 IU and they, they just can't get their levels up into that normal range. We put them on 10,000 IU uh, and, and they get there and they stay there. On the other hand, I've seen people 
who were given 50,000 IU from their practitioner a while back and kept taking that. And now they have toxic levels of vitamin D. So there is a, there is a Goldilocks range here. More is not better. Uh, too much vitamin D can cause kidney stones and, um, you know, ends up putting calcium in the soft tissues where you don't want it. Uh, it can maybe even increase the risk of heart disease that we don't know that yet. So I would say, yeah, generally like, um, Four to 5,000 IU is a good target for most people. And then just get tested a couple times a year to make sure that you're in that sweet spot of 40 to 60 um, and maybe towards a higher end if you have any challenges. Yeah, great advice. And um, I'm going to share... I know you, you weren't here to advertise today, but I'm going to show everybody your vitamin D because I love that it's a liquid. First of all, it's super easy to administer, right? And it's got the K2 in it, which is critical to have both. I know you're going to talk about K2 yeah. as well, but, um, but this is how many servings are in here? 600. Talk about a bargain. It's I a mean, lot. really, this is cheaper <laughs> than the Walmart version and it's so much better. It's, you got the bioavailable D3 without any crap additives in it and no artificial colors or any of the garbage that yep. they put in. Just it has MCT, MCT oil, oil which is awesome mm -hmm. because, you know, a lot of these vitamin Ds are with these, with are paired with vegetable oil and you don't want that, yep. you know, the MCT oil is great yep. for your brain too, on top of it. So, so yeah. Price per serving, this is just incredible. And you guys are all going to get um, up to 50% off on these supplements. Um, so just definitely use the links that we're providing. But this is really great, Chris. It's well done. I am um, yeah, excited you. about that. Yeah. And I love that you we can, have... you know, you could titrate up. It's a thousand IUs and you can titrate up on this, or you think that's too much K2 to do that. And you just want to do. Oh, no, no. You can, you can definitely, like, this is why I made it this way. It's, I was irritated <laughs> as a clinician <laughs> that it was hard to find a product so we have a 2000 iu of vitamin d in the multi which we can mm -hmm. talk about oh, at right. some point but the reason i did it this way where you know some people have asked like well why didn't you just put 5000 in the multi if that's you know well the reason for that is that's too much for some people and i didn't want you know people to not be able to take the multi because it's got too much vitamin d and as I said before, Jody, we're moving towards more of like a personalized dose of vitamin D. So 2000 is safe for almost everybody, 2000 IU in the multi. And then, my, then we release this product so that people can titrate up based on what their particular needs are. So if somebody needs 10,000 IU per day, they can totally do that and get that easily with the D3 and K2. Now K2, which we'll talk about in a bit, it's non-toxic even at high doses. So the, the, the Japanese osteoporosis studies have used up to 25, 30, even more milligrams per day. So the, the amount that's in this is 120 micrograms. So we're not even close to the threshold of what you know uh, could be tolerated for K2. The only consideration would be that K2, like K1, um, can interfere with clotting warfarin and other uh, coagulation medications. So if someone is has a blood issue and they're taking medication like that, they should pro they should check with their physician about whether any vitamin K or K2 is safe at any dose. But assuming you're healthy and you're just taking it for you know to support bone health and cardiovascular health and things like that, then you should be able to titrate up to, you know, eight, 10,000 uh, IU of vitamin D3. And the amount of K2 in that is still well within the, the reference range, the ranges, there's a safe, tolerable intake range. Okay. I, I, I'm super excited that you did it that way, because a lot of times with my clients, you, I have to titrate up gradually on vitamin D. Vitamin D is a hormone. And so if you do too much, if you just start with 10,000 I use or do a prescription. Don't even get me started on K1. I mean, a K1, D1. But, um, but <laughs> you know, those of you who are still prescribing D, uh, K1, and Chris might want to speak to that, but, but the K2 is what you want. And, and um, this is MK4, which is a, a bioavailable form, which is great. And you, you want to titrate up slowly on D, not just start out with a big bolus dose, because you can suppress other hormones by doing that, first of all. And, you know, it can be immunosuppressive in huge doses too. So it's great if you have an autoimmune disease, a flare, you can get those, like Chris was saying, get the vitamin D levels high to kind of suppress the immune system a little bit. But, 
But yeah. this kind of thing, you can titrate up, start with one or two drops and, and every few days go up a drop so you can, so they're not going to get hot flashes, they're not going to have issues with too much right. D. I actually had a client who was having hot flashes and I looked at what her supplements, yeah. I'm like, you got to stop taking 10,000 IUs of vitamin D every day because it was too much for her. Yeah, it can and, be and too much it for went away people. when she stopped, yeah. yeah. So well, I see we have a question from uh, Margo, looks like, and is it safe to recommend uh, to recommend based on 25 testing without testing 125 vitamin D. Great question. Uh, great question. So for people who are not aware, there's uh, different um, metabolites of vitamin D you can test. There's 25 uh, D and 125 D, which is the more active form. I tested both on patients for many, many years, you know, hundreds and hundreds of tests. And generally 125 D testing is not needed to determine adequate, you know, appropriate dose for vitamin D. There are only some rare situations where people have either genetic polymorphisms or uh, health conditions that will impact the conversion of 25D to 125D. And in those situations, it can be helpful, but for the vast majority of people, just um, testing 25D levels tends to be enough. And if the 25D level is starting to get into the 70 to 80 range, especially if they're not getting adequate K2 or A, which protect against the toxicity of D, then that, that's, uh, that's problematic. And conversely, if you're seeing uh, 25D uh, below 35 or 40, then that would be a, a sign that uh, bringing more on board might be helpful. Yeah, great question. There's another question from Linda. Does does high vitamin D suppress estrogen? There is a relationship between D and estrogen, and it's one of the reasons why I am uncomfortable with just the more is better <laughs> approach that you know tends to be prevalent in our in, in the U.S. and and I for a while was seeing patients come in regularly with D levels in 90s or even over 100 and. Even LabCorp, which doesn't always get it right, and Quest, they flag those results with red ink because there is plenty of research to suggest that that can be problematic and, and you know potentially interfering with hormone regulation because vitamin D is a secosteroid, so it actually has hormonal functions um, and can interfere with other hormone production in the body at those high levels. So yeah, thanks for your question, Linda. Yeah. So actually, this is a good segue. You need a mineral to convert vitamin D to its final form, right, Chris? And this is yes, like so yes. many practitioners get this wrong. They'll just load people up on vitamin D without magnesium, right, to, yeah. to help convert it. Yeah. And so you could be I know some people are like, I keep taking vitamin D, but my vitamin D levels don't go up. Well, you're probably yeah. magnesium deficient, right, Chris? That's right. And it works both ways. And we can talk about that, too. But um this has uh, been a like kind of ish, uh, uh, thing that I've really been a drum I've been banging on for a long time. It's nutrient synergy. You know, when we eat food, food doesn't just have one nutrient. In it, you know, it has multiple nutrients and it has enzymes and cofactors, and that's all of those nutrients and enzymes and cofactors work synergistically to help with the absorption and assimilation of the nutrients in a given food and. We, we are only, I think, scratching the surface of understanding all of these interactions, because as you can imagine, if food, if there are multiple nutrients coming in, multiple relationships between those nutrients, it gets complicated fast. But one of the best established connections is with magnesium and vitamin D. So magnesium, um, as you said, Jody, uh, magnesium is required to convert less active forms of vitamin D into the more active forms. So even if you're getting enough vitamin D on paper, if you're not, if you're magnesium deficient, which the vast majority of Americans are, then you can still be biologically deficient in vitamin D. And that just means, yes, you're getting enough on paper, but biologically your body is still starving for vitamin D because the magnesium is interfering with that conversion. But as I said, it also works the other way. Um, magnesium requires vitamin D to be absorbed in the intestine. So if you're eat, you know, eating or taking magnesium supplements and you have plenty of magnesium on paper, if you're vitamin D deficient, you will end up effectively being magnesium deficient still. So you have a bi-directional relationship in this case with magnesium and vitamin D. 
and magnesium, you know, since we're on the topic, we can just segue in. Is it's involved in seven over seven hundred enzymatic reactions in the body. Now, this little personal anecdote here: when I first started doing this work, that number was three hundred. So, in the last you know fourteen, fifteen years since I've been doing this, scientists have identified an additional four hundred functions or enzymatic pathways that magnesium is involved with that we didn't even know about. 12, you know, 15 years ago. So I wonder what it will be in 15 more years. The point being, it's extremely important for all, you know, virtually all aspects of physiology because it's required to synthesize DNA, RNA, and proteins. And those are the building blocks of life. Nothing happens in the body without DNA and RNA <laughs> and proteins being involved, literally nothing. So it's involved in energy production, glucose regulation, uh, formation of bone, muscle contraction, regulation of heart rhythm, nerve function, production of glutathione, which most people know is one of the most important antioxidants in the body, um, and virtually all enzymes in the body that metabolize vitamin D require magnesium, which is required for the synthesis, transport, and activation of vitamin D, going back to your point, Jody. So, Again, it's not surprising to, to see that symptoms of magnesium deficiency are, are, are diverse, they include uh, muscle weakness, fatigue, nausea, headaches, migraines. Uh, incidentally, if, if you're working with people and, and migraine is an issue, magnesium supplements, one of the easiest, fastest things you can try to see if that will move the needle. Um, loss of appetite, uh, cravings for stimulants like coffee. That's an interesting one that I've noticed in, in my practice. Um, abnormal heart rhythm, must, uh, uh, numbness or tingling, paresthesia. There's another thing here with magnesium that I want to highlight that this is true for many other nutrients where we talked about it in the context of choline, but just how inadequate the RDA is for most nutrients. So the, the RDA is the recommended dietary allowance, and this was never intended to be the optimal amount of a nutrient. It was actually developed in World War II as a way of determining whether the, the, the rations we were creating for soldiers would meet their basic nutritional needs. So this was a wartime effort to make sure that the meal ready to eat packets we were giving our soldiers would, would not lead to a serious deficiency like rickets or scurvy or something like that. It wasn't a bunch of scientists getting in a room saying, what is the optimal amount of this nutrient that everyone could get to feel great and live a long, healthy life? That is not what the RDA was established to answer. So the RDA for magnesium is 320 milligrams per day for women and 420 milligrams for men. But another issue with the RDA is that it's, it's based on body weight and other factors which change over time in the American population. So when the RDA for magnesium was last published, that was 1997. The average body weight at that time for women was 133 pounds and for men it was 166 pounds. Well, fast forward to today when the current average body weight for women is 169 pounds. So that's a 36 pound difference in that period 25 year period and for men it's 196 pounds so again a 33 pound difference because the rda is a formula that includes weight if you researchers publish a paper and said if you plug in these new body weights to the rda formula that would effectively increase the rda for men to a minimum of 575 milligrams all the way up to 650 um, you know, that's up from 420. And for women, it would be uh, 460 to about 530 milligrams per day, up from 320. So that's a huge increase. That's like more than 200 milligrams a day increase in, in magnesium need. But here's the thing. Most Americans don't even meet the woefully inadequate current RDA. <laughs> They're falling short of even that 320 uh, or 420 milligram for, for women and men respectively. And they're falling short by 200 milligrams at least of the current updated or, or the updated RDA. So the average intake for, for um, men is 340 a day. So that's below the 420. And for women, it's about 255 to 275. So that, that needs to increase by over 200 milligrams a day for people to get to the optimal amount. 
And I just, you know, I don't think that that's possible anymore with food because of soil depletion of magnesium. We've seen in the last, since 1940, between 1940 and 1991, the magnesium content in vegetables in the U.S. decreased by 25%. Mm. Um, in the U.K. it was more, it was 35%. And that's 1991. We're now, you know, 35 years um, past that almost, 32, 33 years past that. And so it's likely that the depletion has continued because of industrial agriculture, overuse of pesticides, chemical fertilizers, et cetera. And I've, I've seen some estimates that suggest that it's probably closer to 50% decline. So what that means is your grandparents ate, you know, magnesium rich foods, um, like green leafy vegetables or seeds or nuts or something like that. You eat those same foods today, you're getting, you know, between 25 and 50% less magnesium than they were getting just two generations ago. So that is one of the, the biggest problems that we're facing now, yeah. not just with magnesium, but with a bunch of other nutrients. Yeah, we are seeing a big problem with that. And, you know, one of the big issues also is that insulin resistance actually robs your body of magnesium. So, you know, you have someone diabetic or insulin resistant, or anyone with an A1C over really 5.2 should be on magnesium because it can help, you know, lower their insulin resistance and insulin resistance causes magnesium deficiency. Magnesium deficiency causes insulin resistance. So it's a vicious cycle. And, uh, you know, we're seeing just, um, so many people with muscle cramps and hypertension is another big one that um, sometimes, you know, just getting someone on adequate magnesium can make a difference. But one of the things that I think people don't realize is the red blood cell magnesium reference range is 4.2 to 6.8. And you really want to be in the top third of that reference range. And, you know, if you're a lot of times people are tested in there, you know, my magnesium is 4.5, I'm fine. It's like, no, you are woefully low. And it's part of the reason why you're having symptoms, right? Yeah. And a lot of people don't even don't, most people aren't getting that test in the first place and mm. or any test of, for magnesium for that matter. I would that's say that's very unusually offered in the conventional medical world, certainly in the functional medicine space, it's more common, but most people go to their doctor and never once in their entire life get a magnesium test and have no idea that that could be contributing to their muscle cramps or their high blood sugar, or their high blood pressure, which are problems that are totally an epidemic in the US. Like I've seen some studies that suggest that just normalizing magnesium levels could have a significant impact on the burden of metabolic disease in, in the United States, which costs us hundreds and hundreds of billions a year and just crazy impact on quality of life and you know just people's ability to function and thrive as they grow older so it's it's a huge problem and it's makes me angry and sad because it's relatively easy to fix it's not we're not talking about some you know heroic intervention you know high tech whatever we're, we're it's it's relatively it's a very safe nutrient to supplement with and i can segue into uh, so I'm just going to show one more, uh, one more uh, oh, yeah. supplement here. We, we Chris got one does of those offer too. <laughs> the bioavailable mag, and so this looks fantastic. You've got a, you've got a, uh, some chelate here, uh, magnesium bisglycinate chelate. Mm -hmm. So it's very bioavailable, really great for muscle, cardiovascular, etc., um, and insulin resistance, etc. Now, I'm curious why you put a little magnesium oxide. Is that because most people have a little constipation or? Is it? Uh, uh, it was. It's more of a an issue with um, formulation and what can fit in the in the capsules and concentration. But actually, in the next uh, probably three weeks, we figured out a way to do it with 100% buffered chelate. And so, in about oh, awesome three to four weeks, uh, we, we're going to have a reformulated version of Biovale Mag that has 100% uh, buffered chelate. And in fact, I reformulated. Uh, three or four of the products recently, because th this is what's fun for me is like, I just get to continually improve the product and make them better and better. They were already amazing when we first introduced them, but I keep re me being me. I just keep researching, keep learning, keep wanting, you know, keep wanting to improve them as much as possible. And so that's one thing we're doing with, um, BioVail mag with the organ product. We, we figured out a process for, fitting even more 
uh, organ material in the same number of capsules. So what we will have the highest amount of, of organ material per serving of organs than any other brand out there that I'm aware of. So I'm excited about that. We reformulated the mushroom product um, where, so that it's 100% organic mushrooms and full spectrum extract, um, which is really exciting. And, and we have eight, three eight to one extracts, which make it even more effective and potent. And I reformulated the multi as well with a bunch of great changes, including now 450 milligrams of choline in different forms. So I have yeah. it right here. <laughs> that's it's fabulous. That, yeah, that, that, that's going to start shipping the new version of that in two weeks. So oh, awesome. um, super exciting. Yeah. yeah, I have to say, I'm super impressed with this. I know you didn't mention B vitamins as a defi as a big nutrient issue. And I know, you, you know, we, we could they probably are. We had to stop at six. Yeah, we had to stop at six. <laughs> yeah. You could have told me to do eight. I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, but yeah. with, with, uh, with the B vitamins, what I love about this, just to not take it too sidetracked, but the bioavailable, it has like, it has molybdenum and manganese and things like that. So a lot of multis don't have those. But I also love that it has the right form of B6, which, you know, so many, even the premium brands often have the pyridoxine HCL in them. And that can be an issue for some people. It can build up if it doesn't get into your cells properly, it can cause neuropathy and nerve issues. And, yeah. you know, I take a real stand on that. I don't want people, especially the clients that I work with that are really sick, I don't want them taking pyridoxine. So this is 100% yeah. P5P for the B6. It's yeah. got methylated, all the methylated Bs. It's got like the right ratios. It's really well done. So I'm super and excited got, to be taking this now. We've got R5P too, which is oh. the same idea with riboflavin. So it's, it's the active form of riboflavin in the same way that the P5P is the active form of, of pyridoxine or B6. So yeah, we definitely wanted to have all those active forms and, and not, you know, methylcobalamin, methylfolate, um, and uh, even like with selenium, we're using XL, which is a much more active form of selenium that mimics uh, the type, type of selenium that you get from food instead of the selenomethionine, which is a different, you know, form that tends to be in most supplements. So we, we did choose all of the most bioidentical, bioavailable forms of all of the nutrients in the multi, and that was important to me. That's great. Um, I'm going to quickly answer Shelly's question about magnesium, then we can hop over to potassium and quickly, you know, cover, try to at least quickly cover potassium, vitamin E, and vitamin K2. Um, so best form of magnesium, definitely like a chelated form, like a glycinate or, or malate. Um, you, they have di uh, different uses, like glycinate, I think is the best general form. That's why I used it in this supplement and in the multi. Uh, malate has some interesting benefits for, for brain health and brain function uh, and energy production, like ATP production, uh, but not as effective in my experience with muscle, you know, the muscle relaxing effect and some of the, uh, you know, uh, digestive benefits of magnesium that a lot of people uh, seek out. So that's a, a chelated, you know, buffered form will be more bioavailable and more absorbable than something like mag citrate or mag magnesium oxide. All right, so we don't have a ton of time. So I'm just gonna briefly cover um, potassium. Super important, again, over 90% of Americans don't get enough. Uh, and low potassium intake is associated with hypertension, which is the number one risk factor for cardiovascular disease, which is the number one cause of death. So you can just draw a pretty causal, a pretty causal chain there, a pretty direct link between potassium and our, our longevity and, and uh, health span. And um, mo many, you know, some people are, are able to get enough potassium with diet, you know, given that 90% of Americans are deficient, we know that most aren't, but one of the challenges with potassium is that a lot of folks now are doing lower carbohydrate diets, and a lot of the, the sources of potassium are higher carbohydrate foods. So bananas, potatoes, uh, sweet potatoes are, some of the highest sources of potassium. And if you're eating a low carb diet, you're probably not eating very, very many of those foods. Uh, but some um, l good low carb sources of potassium would be uh, halibut and, and rockfish, beet greens, um, mustard greens, sesame seeds, 
kale, uh, endive, bamboo shoots. Uh, tomatoes can have a, a decent uh, amount of potassium and mushrooms as well. Um, so that's an idea if you're on a lower carb diet for how to meet your potassium needs. Potassium supplementation is tricky. And this is why we didn't include it in the multi. And I also didn't include uh, iron for, the, for that reason and iodine. And we had a very low dose of calcium in the first original multi formula, but I actually took it out entirely in the, in the reformulated version because these are all nutrients that I believe require an individualized approach. Because some people, for example, people with diabetes, blood sugar issues, kidney issues, uh, blood pressure, potassium supplementation can be problematic. And guess what? A lot of Americans have those issues, you know, and by some estimation, two, you know, up to two and three Americans have some issue on that spectrum. And uh, potassium supplements of up to maybe a thousand milligrams a day are generally safe for healthy people. They're not necessarily for people with diabetes or insulin resistance or impaired kidney function. Um, they can actually be quite, uh, quite a high high risk of um, adverse effects and, and uh, you know pretty serious adverse effects, especially if you're taking high doses. So we we chose to leave that out of the formula. Uh, if you do choose to supplement with potassium, I recommend you do it under the supervision of a clinician. And, you know, potassium citrate is probably the best form and, and limiting to like a thousand milligrams a day. Uh, again, especially if you're not under supervision is, is, a, is a good option there. Anything on that before we jump over to vitamin E and K1 and K2, Jody? No, I think that's great, Chris. Thanks for that All info. Right. And great. Yeah, I agree. It's a... It's a tough one, and I'm glad you didn't put it in, <laughs> in the moment. Yeah, it's tricky. <laughs> it's a tricky one. So vitamin E, um, 89% of Americans don't get enough. So that's the only <laughs> – we're now below the 90% the threshold, but not very far below. And here's a kind of interesting thing about vitamin E is that it's the – it's one of – it's one of the, I think the only nutrient that I can think of that – can sometimes decline in, in your intake when you switch to a healthier diet. Why is that? Because the, one of the main sources of vitamin E for most Americans is vegetable oil. So, you know, we tell our clients and our patients not to eat industrial seed oils and vegetable oils and to favor healthy, you know, fats, coconut oil, avocado oil, olive oil, et cetera. And vitamin E actually, so their vitamin E intake might, might decline in that situation. Yet, on the other hand, they will, most Americans have very high tissue levels of polyunsaturated fat, like omega-6 fats from eating these industrial seed oils for so long. And vitamin E is an absolutely critical antioxidant. Uh, and there's an entire physiological system in the body that's designed to concentrate it at the expense of other forms, alpha tocopherol. So it's a crucial antioxidant, very important antioxidant in the brain. And as I said, 89% of Americans are falling short. So the dietary sources here, are, um, nuts and seeds tend to be the, the best sources, like sunflower seeds, almonds, hazelnuts, pecans, some fruits like apric apricot and avocado, some fish like trout, some vegetables, not a lot, like spinach, asparagus, and chard are decent source. Um, the, the challenge, again, like with potassium is that a lot of studies have shown that higher dose alpha tocopherol supplementation, like in the 20, 25 to 30 plus milligrams per day, not only doesn't help, but is actually associated with a higher risk of heart disease and prostate cancer. <laughs> so that's oh. obviously not what you're looking for when you're taking a supplement. Um, in the first version of the original version of the multi, I didn't include any tocopherols uh, at all. And in this next reformulated version, after a lot of consultation with my scientific advisory board, um, Chris Masterjohn and others, I decided to add a little bit of tocopherol into the multi. And then as you're highlighting here, Jody, we also have another form of vitamin E um, called tocotrienol that we offer in supplement form. Now, tocotrienols are a unique form of vitamin E that only were only recently discovered in the last 20, 25 years. And they're 40 to 50 times more potent as antioxidants than tocopherols. They've been shown to maintain healthy metabolic function, healthy lipid levels, uh, brain function, 
a healthy inflammatory response, maintain healthy bones, and support immune function. And they don't have, uh, unlike tocopherols, supplementing with tocotrienols does not have the, the negative long-term effect that supplementing with higher doses of tocopherols does. I love that you, that this is from an auto plant. I mean, that, uh, has so many benefits. I actually recently attended a lecture on just the benefits of this Anato um, and bioavailable E in the form of tocotrienol. Um, just so many incredible benefits to it. So it's uh, that's a really nice yeah, formulation you have. It's one of the most exciting discoveries in nutritional science, I think, in the past you know thirty years. So, lastly, vitamin K. And K2, so about 70% of Americans are deficient, so still more than half, well over half, almost three quarters. Um, and K1 is different than K2. So before 20, 2006, so we're just talking about the last 17 years, they, the USDA didn't distinguish between K1 and K2. They just called it all K. But we know that K1 and K2 have different functions. And K1 is better known, so I'll focus a little bit more on K2 here. Um, K2 is particularly important for bone health, whereas K1 is more thought, you know, more important for activating blood clotting pro proteins. Uh, K2 helps determine, like helps calcium to be deposited in the bones and the teeth where it's needed and keep it out of the soft tissue where we absolutely don't want it. <laughs> we don't want our tissue cal calcifying. So, um, K2 has been shown to lower the risk of cardiovascular disease, improve bone health, brain health, it has an anti-cancer impact, and it, it promotes insulin sensitivity among many other uh, functions. And although humans can convert some K1 into K2, that conversion is really uh, limited in a lot of people. And so we can't really depend on that uh, as a sole source of K2. So the, the but, but then the foods that are high in K2 are not necessarily commonly eaten foods in the U.S. at least. So, you know, cheese and fermented foods are probably the, the most common source of K2, but you know, a lot of people aren't eating dairy products and a lot of people don't eat a lot of fermented foods like kimchi or sauerkraut. Um, natto, which is a Japanese fermented soy product, which most people either will throw up almost when they eat it. It's so disgusting to them, or they, if, you know, they might like it. There's usually not like a middle ground response to, to natto, but I think it's pretty safe to say that very few people are eating it in the U.S., period. And then goose liver is the second um, most common source of K2. And again, I'm going to go out on a limb and say a lot of people are not eating goose liver. Uh, and then, you know, cheese, egg yolks, um, like dark meat, dark chicken meat has some and, and, and butter. But, but as you pointed out earlier, Jody, with choline, it's the same with K2. Conventionally raised uh, poultry do not, are not viable sources of K2 or, or cows. It's the pasture raised animals because they're eating grass that has K1 and they convert it into K2. So it's very important to get pasture raised sources or supplement. And uh, you showed the liquid D3 and K2 product we have before, and then the multi also has K2 in it. And we have a blend of both MK4 and MK7, which are different forms of K2 that have uh, uh, different benefits. So we made it. Those are the yeah, six no, nutrients. Great. Um, thank you so much. And I, let me just say, um, so many so many people are focused on bone health and bone density. And, you know, it's important to take K2 with your D and your magnesium to channel the calcium into your bones. And it drives me crazy that conventional practitioners are just telling you, take more and more calcium, take more and more calcium. Where's it going to go? To your arteries, to calcify exactly. your arteries? I mean, <laughs> it drives me crazy because my mother-in-law is like, you know, she's taking her calcium every day and no K2 and nothing else. And it's like, oh my gosh, you're putting yourself at a high risk of cardiovascular disease by doing that. So, um, so I love that you highlighted K2 as being so important. It's often very overlooked. And I have a lot of clients that come to me, they're just on vitamin D and no K2 and, uh, and you know, yeah. they have osteopenia. <laughs> it's like, okay, why yeah. is that? And it's just but, like um, what we said before, all these nutrients work together, right? So, and exactly. that's how it works in food. So it's not surprising that that's how it works in our bodies too. Yeah. Well, Chris, thank you so much. I just want to um, reiterate one more time that you all can get uh, an account 
and you'll be an affiliate for Chris. Um, you have to have a practice, or if you have, if you're an influencer, you have over 5,000 followers, you can become a, um, an, an affiliate. So you'll have a link to share with your patients or clients and they can buy the, buy the supplements and you will get a commission on the supplement. So it's, it's not in any dispensaries, but you can use this as a, as like a dispensary, or if you just want to purchase something for the first time and try it out, uh, there's a coupon, there's a link right there. If you use that link, you'll, you don't even need a coupon code. It goes right to, um, it's adaptnaturals.com slash Jody, J-O-D-I, and you'll get 20% off any purchase. And I'll just show that there's a variety of great supplements here. If you all can see um, on the on the page, go check it out. And, uh, you know, I love that Chris, Chris does so much research and, you know, really put everything he knows into these supplements. So I really trust his opinion on things and, and just looking at what from everything I've learned in functional medicine, these all make so much sense to me. And I love, I can't wait to try the organ one. I think I'm going to do that one next. And when yeah. I run out of some other things, oh, and you didn't even mention the myco, but oh my gosh, this is awesome yeah. with all That's the one of, our, one of my favorite. I, yeah. I, I, I also want to Goodness. briefly mention a, a couple of things. So yeah, the mushroom product is like a blend of eight of the, all of the most evidence-based research back mushrooms for brain cognitive health immune function skin health i call it a modern fountain day uh, fountain of youth that's really kind of what it what it comes down to uh and then in a in july we're coming out with a product that i'm super excited about it's a blend of the highest quality and purest fish oil with curcumin and black seed oil together oh, wow. so I very potent uh, effect and antioxidant anti-inflammatory great for you know muscle performance recovery pain mood brain function etc um I, po I posted a link just to the panel of um one of the things that we're doing that i think is somewhat unique in the space is making it very easy for affiliate partners to create their own custom personalized landing page so um, there's lots of opportunities here for people to um, get this out to their audience. You know, if you followed my work for any length of time, you know that my, I'm in this to um, make people's lives better. That's what gets me excited and gets me jumping out of bed in the morning. And um, this is one easy way that we can all do that. Like we can all support people's health just by helping them to meet their nutrient needs. It, nutri I say that nutrients are the rising tide that lift all boats. So it's like one thing that we can do that will make everything better is, is making sure we have adequate nutrient levels. Yeah, great, appreciate it. Yeah, if you guys could use the link that we provided, I'd appreciate it. Um, Terry will put it in the, if we're on, on Facebook and in the email it's as the well. Google Docs, right? Right. Yeah. And so you can just sign up today to be a partner and you'll be able to offer these to your patients and clients. Chris, thank you so much for coming on. This was fascinating. It was really educational. I hope you all got some uh, good, good um, pointers that you can bring to your practice right away and pearls of wisdom. And if you like this and you're on Facebook, please give us some hearts to let so and tag your friends in the post. So let everybody know. Um, that, you know, that Chris is on today and it'll, we love when you come on and, you know, the more, uh, more we, more hearts we get, the more we can have people like Chris to come on. So thank you so much, Chris. I really appreciate it. And good luck with your oh, you're welcome, Jenny. This is, uh, Thank wonderful. you. For... They're flying off the shelves, guys. Get them before they sell up. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Jody, for having me on. I always appreciate our conversation and thanks for all the work you're doing to get the, you know, more functional medicine and functional health coaching and health coaching out there. It's just, as you know, I'm passionate about that. And it's so important. So thank you for doing the work you do. Yeah, absolutely. All right, everybody take care. Bye-bye. Bye everyone.